So as part of Bauhaus, this is a Bauhaus evening presentation, and in this centennial celebration of the school of the Bauhaus, um, we have selected two of our Bauhaus-oriented, uh, in fact, um, uh, influenced and, 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 and created uh, people from that time period to present for you tonight. So we have, um, first you're going to meet Bobby Benedict, and then you're going to meet Herbert Bayer himself. So to set the stage for you, um, I do need to ask you to travel back in time to 1997, okay? We're going to be at an Aspen Historical Society event, so that much end. And we have sadly lost Fritz Benedict about two years ago. And his wife, Fabi, is here tonight to share with us both memories of his life and also to introduce us a little bit to her life. So ladies and gentlemen, if you would please put your hands together for Fabi Benedict. Okay, Fritz, looks like I got cornered. You know that they have all this information at the Aspen Historical Society about you, but nothing on me. Where did I come from? How did we meet? Um, what was our life together? Now, you know how gabby I am, but I really hate speaking in public. So, stay with me, will you? Here we go. <laughs> Good evening. I am Jemima Fabienne Craban Lloyd Frankel Benedict. But you can call me Fabit, Fabi. <laughs> now, I really hate speaking in public, so I would be using my notes, and I hope you'll forgive me, but it makes me very, very nervous speaking up here. Um, and you know something? I have been known to forget my own children's names if I don't see them in print. I don't know if you guys do that too. Now the most important of all my names is Benedict. I was married to Fritz for 45 glorious years. He was the sweetest, kindest person on earth. And he was so friendly that almost everyone in Aspen thought he was their best friend. And he probably was. You know that tent over on the north side of town? It's named for Fritz and his brother-in-law, Herbert Beyer. Uh, he built mall, he was responsible for the malls, uh, the uh, Aspen Institute, the grounds there he did with Herbert Beyer, um, built buildings, ski, uh, ski resorts, just anything you could think of, and he was fun. Our son, Nicholas, said he was the biggest kid he ever met, growing up kid. He was wonderful. Fritz was the love of my life, and there are no words to tell you how much I miss him. Well, anyway, here's about my other names. Jemima. It's biblical, and it has to do with my mother's Jewish heritage. She was an existentialist poet and artist. She was brilliant, beautiful, um, she was so talented, but very, very eccentric. If you want to know more about her, you should read Becoming Modern, the story of becoming Nina Loy. Um, then we have the other name, Fabien Cravan Loy. That belongs to my father, uh, but he was mostly known as Arthur Cravan. That's just one of the many names he made up, but it's the one that stuck. His real name was Fabian Lloyd. During the early 1900s, he was um, Europe's middleweight boxing champion. He was a goddess poet, and he was very involved in some of their causes, uh, like being a draft dodger. Uh, there's a story that one time, he was uh, found standing stark naked on a podium, <coughs> ranting about one of his causes. He was really very eccentric. He was uh, the nephew of Oscar Wilde. He was tall, handsome, and not as a fruitcake. <laughs> he disappeared in Mexico before I was born. The Frankel name belongs to my first husband. Very, very nice man. And he was so protective of me. 
I'll tell you more about him when we get to the New York City part of my life. Well, since Fritz arrived before I did, you should know a little bit about how he got here. He was born on a farm in Wisconsin in 1914. He studied landscape architecture and apprenticed with Frank Lloyd Wright. He was a ski racer, and then he was part of the Army's 10th Mountain Division of Special Troops during World War II. Most of you know this. They trained over at Camp Hale near Leadville, but they did some of their maneuvers here, and they vowed to come back and start a ski resort. So one day, they were all standing over on Durant, you know, about where the gondola is, and they were looking up at the mountain, planning their ski runs. So Fritz stepped aside, looked up at Red Mountain, he said, that'd be a pretty good place to plunk down and watch this town grow. So, after the war, he took his GI money, got a loan from his mom, uh, got in an old Jeep, came to Aspen, and he bought 600 of acres of Red Mountain from an old rancher for $20 an acre. <laughs> what do you think it's worth now? So he uh, lived up there in an old barn, and he created kind of a dude ranch for hunters and fishermen. Then one day, he went to an auction, and he scratched his nose at the wrong time. And he got a bunch of hogs. So then, he had a pig farm. And that's where I ended up being with him. So here's my long journey to Aspen. I was conceived in Mexico City, born in England on April 5th, 1919, baptized in Geneva, Switzerland, raised by my sweet Italian nanny, Julia, in Florence, Italy, until I was four years old, lived on and off with my mother, Mina Loy, and my half-sister, Joella, in Paris, France, until I was 19. Then I moved to New York City. In Paris, Mina's intellectual salon included Brancusi, um, Picasso, um, Gertrude Stein, um, oh, who else? Hemingway and June Barnes, and on and on and on. Now, Mina said I was a very naughty little girl. If I didn't like someone, I would just crawl under the table and bite them on their ankle. <laughs> and I kind of wasn't going to tell you this, but one time I even pissed in a pastor's hat. <laughs> I guess I wasn't, I was a naughty little girl. So, <laughs> Mina had two really dumb ideas about children. She felt they should be raised only by, by servants when they were very young and that formal education would thwart creativity. So when she picked me up from in Florence from my nanny, I was so afraid of that beautiful woman, I just clung in back of her skirts. I didn't, I didn't even know who she was. I couldn't, couldn't even associate with her. But then um, I immediately and then the schooling. I only went through eighth grade in school, and that was even off and on. Now later on, I took care of all of the all of the business, all the legal and accounting things for both Mina and for Fritz. And that education would really have helped a little bit. <laughs> Mina did think it was important to know languages, and she hired tutors when she could afford them, or she would send me off to the country. Uh, with different families of different origins, and I'm losing my stance. See, it's because I'm nervous. <laughs> um, so then I learned to speak fluent Italian, German, French, Latin, and finally English. And I was quite good at art. Um, the Queen, England's Queen Mary, bought two of my watercolors when I was only 12 years old. That was pretty good. <laughs> Mina opened a shop uh, with Peggy Guggenheim, you know, the museums, that family. <laughs> Peggy was the only one that ever gave me Christmas presents or birthday presents. Mina always forgot about those dates. She just couldn't be bothered. Well, among other things that Mina designed, designed for, the, for the shop were some really unique lamps, and they had these fantastic shades. She would collect all sorts of, she'd go to the, the uh, flea market and get things. She was so incredibly creative. In her artwork, it's kind of, if you think of Robert Rauschenberg, she was a precursor for that. 
And in her writing, she was compared with Gertrude Stein. So you really have to read that book on her sometime. So Joella and I would help construct these lampshades. Now remember, Joella, she was my half-sister, and she was 12 years older than I am. But then in 1927, Joella married Julian Levy and moved to New York City. Ju uh, Julian's millionaire father backed him in one of the most creative art galleries in all of New York City. And he showed Salvador Dali, Alexander Calder, McCreed, and others in America. Later on, he also started the film library at MoMA, Museum of Modern Art. So Mina and I were left in Paris, and by the time I was about 18 years old, the shop closed, and we completely ran out of money. We had to sell almost all our furniture to pay bills. I had to even give up my treasure dog. He was a very fancy breed of Grand Pyrenees. Joella sent money for my fare to come to New York. Um, Mina stayed in Paris. She finally sold the apartment, and she bought my dog back and brought him to America with her. I hated New York. Paris was so exciting. There was so much energy and all that music in the streets and those outdoor cafes. Mm -hmm. I thought New York was cold and unfriendly. But Joella made arrangements for me to go to Parsons School of Design. And I was even awarded a scholarship for the second year. But then Mina arrived, I moved in with her, and I had to go to work to help support us. So Mina and I started making those really fabulous lampshades again. Uh, we made jewelry, buttons, perfume bottles, and dress patterns for Vogue magazines. Um, I had to take them around the city and peddle them and to places like Helena Rubinstein and Harry Winston, the jeweler. I even made this adorable little bracelet for that darling little Shirley Temple. So I was pretty talented. Um, and I even modeled one time for, oh, I can't remember her name, but I didn't like modeling very much. Julian Levy was very much in love with, with Joella but he was also obsessed with other women. Finally, Joella had enough of his shenanigans and divorced him in 1942. And this is where the Aspen connection comes in. Joella married Herbert Beyer, who was a friend and business associate of Walter Petko. Herbert had been with the Bauhaus School in Germany before the Hitler regime closed it in 1933. Uh, Joella and Herbert married in 1944. They moved to Aspen the following year. Now, you all know it was Pepka's dream to turn this little funny mining town into a center to nurture man's mind, body, spirit. That's the Aspen idea. And Herbert was put in charge of the renovation of the town. So when she got settled, Joella wrote to me and she told me she found an adorable cowboy she thought I should marry. <laughs> I thought that was great, but I was already married. <laughs> now, I already told you how really gutsy I was about peddling Mina's work around town and my designs, but I was very, very shy with men. I hadn't been raised by a father. I didn't go to school with young men. And when I moved to New York City, I was in a crowd with Joella and Herbert, and she was older than I was, so, so they were older. And Hans Frankel, Frank Frankel, I shouldn't forget his name, was <laughs> one of them. Now he was German, but he had been with the Gauls Freedom Fighters during the war. So he, um, and he joined them, and um, now you remember, I was quite good at art. So among the many jobs I had in New York for a short time, I was hired by the British Intelligence Agency to forge papers. <laughs> I was very unjustly accused of being a spy. <laughs> and that's where Hans came, and he was so good to me, and he helped me get out of that mess. And he made me feel safe, and he could take care of me. So I married him, but it just wasn't as much. Anyway, I went to Aspen for the visit, <laughs> and after two nights, 
with Joella's other, uh, once again, rather middle-aged people. I asked her where all those cute cowboys were. <laughs> she said, you're too late. The one I told you about is already engaged. That was Fritz Benedict. Now, this is how the story gets better. A couple of nights later, we all went to a square dance at the Hotel Jerome. There was Fritz with his sort of fiancé. He was such a cute man. I could tell he'd taken a shine to me, and he thought I was very funny. We were all sitting around the bar at the hotel, and he'd practically fall on the floor laughing at everything I said. Um, his fiancé told Joella I wasn't nearly as pretty as she was. <laughs> at the time, Joella and Herbert had inherited a couple baby owls. Um, Gary Cooper, you remember High Noon? He lived up the hill, and he had shot the mother owl. Mm -hmm. That wasn't a very nice thing to do. He was a really nice man, but that was not a good thing to do. Anyway, the baby owls needed meat, so Fritz would collect mice around his ranch up there on Red Mountain, and he'd bring his little old truck in town going pet, 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 pet down the street at about 7 o'clock in the morning. And I thought, if I wanted to see him again, I better be out there um, so you know, I could kind of hook up there. So I got all dressed up. I took my soy with me because I wanted him to think I was domestic. And I put down in a bed of sweet peas, looking just like Betty Boop. And you know what? He didn't show up that day. And I was freezing, freezing cold. But I made my plans. A costume dinner party was coming up, and I told everyone I couldn't go because they were trying to set me up with a date, and I wanted to be free to operate. So uh, I had my little plan. At the last minute, I said, well, you know, I think I can go after all, but it's too late to really get me a date. Uh, but could I please sit next to, across the table from Fritz Benedict, and of course his fiance. <coughs> So there I was, and when the fiancé got up to go to the ladies' room, I said, oh dear, I feel faint. And Fritz jumped up and said, I'll take you outside. <laughs> Off we went, walked around the block a couple times, and guess what? He asked me to marry him. <laughs> <laughs> I, went to the, I went to Nevada for a board for a divorce and Fritz followed and we came back and we apologized or I apologized to the sort of fiance. We fixed her up with another architect but I think they got married. Now my ex-husband Hans, he gave us a Jaguar convertible for a wedding present. I don't think he was very unhappy about it. <laughs> So Fritz and I lived up on Red Mountain on his struggling ranch for about three years, and then we bought the Bowman Building. That's um, over across from Aspen Square and with uh, Joella and Herbert. Um, Mina eventually moved to Aspen, and we set her up in one of the apartments. She was even more eccentric by then, and Fritz was very sweet with her, but Herbert was more practical, and he was very pragmatic and he had a lot of trouble with her eccentricities. But, we, oh, we all lived there together. I kept my pet lambs where Aspen Square is now. Can you imagine all these cute little lambs over there? Then over the years, people have asked me how I moved to Aspen, to this little kind of cow town, and lived up on a pig farm after being raised in Europe with all these people and, and living in New York City. But what I had really, really loved was going out when my mother would send me out to the country and all the animals would be there. She did it so I could learn other languages, but I just loved being around animals. I always loved animals. And then Aspen, it attracted all these incredibly creative people. And because it was a small town, we all became friends, and the ladies. There was Pussy Pepka with her outrageous <coughs> stories. Marion Davies, um, oh, she was such a pretty nice lady. Tookie Coffin and Pat Moore, do any of you remember them? Yeah. Oh, and they had those wonderful stores, didn't they? And Meryl Ford with her little daughter, Virgie. Virgie and I would go sit at her little tea table, and we had the most wonderful conversations. She was an adorable child. I always loved children. 
And we throw those marvelous, marvelous costume parties and play all sorts of practical jokes. Mm -hmm. Our children said they dreaded April Fool's Day. <laughs> <laughs> and one time, I may have gone a little too far with my jokes, a friend left her standard white poodle with me for a week. She wasn't too happy when her male dog showed up painted or dyed pink. <laughs> so it was a pink poodle. <laughs> so and our one then we had our own wonderful children. Charlotte and Emily came from Basalt. They were 12 and 18 years old. Their mother had died and the father just couldn't take care of them. Jessica was three years old when she came to us and Nicholas arrived when he was only three months old. I love children and I adore raising them. But we needed large living quarters and we eventually built what I call the Flintstone House. It has a rock cave entrance and it blends into the mountain and a grass roof. It's very ecologically sound with solar heat and all those kind of things. There's a greenhouse where all our birds live. I love birds. We had peacocks, cockatoos, and parrots. Uh, and our dogs and horses, we had those too. We even had a Shetland pony that we live in the house sometimes. <laughs> he liked to be there. So even though we owned a lot of land, we did struggle for many years. Every time Fritz came up with a new scheme, I'd say, how in the world are we going to afford that? And he'd say, well, I'm just going to have to drag you by your tail. But I was the one who had to figure out the money. And we usually would just sell another piece of property. Fortunately, the price of that land kept going up. <laughs> Later on, we were very involved in the Aspen Music Festival in school. Fritz became chairman of the board. We opened our home to those beautiful children, those talented musicians, and for fundraising events. We were even able to sponsor the um, dining hall out at the um, rural complex. It's been nicknamed Benedict's Beanery. <laughs> so, here's just one more of my pranks. This will be the last one. Les Anderson took over the music festival's chairmanship, and he really didn't know me very well. So one day, he came soliciting with that adorable Robert Hart, who was president of the music festival. I opened the door uh, of our home wearing torn clothes, snag stockings, a rag tied around my head, and carried a mop and a bucket. And I said, Oh, gentlemen, I'm so sorry. As you can see, we're having a very, very hard time, and we just can't afford to give right now. And Les was horrified, and Robert's in back of him strangling laughing, because he knew the kind of things I did. So other than the pure joy of giving, and mostly to children and animals who were my main cause, there's another reason I like to give. Do any of you have something in your childhood kind of hanging over your head? Well, my mother used to call me a demon. Now, I don't think I was as bad, in spite of what I told you earlier, but I don't think I was as bad as she, she thought I was. But every time I do something a tiny bit nice, I think, well, I'm not so bad after all. I'm not as bad as some people. So. Here I am now without my Fritz. I have that awful glaucoma and sweet Dick Merritt, he takes me back and forth to the office because I don't want to stay home all day. I get lonesome there and I can still do things at the office. Something was wrong with my back and it it's really hurts. Mina passed away in 1966. Joella and Herbert moved to California ages ago and Herbert passed away there. Sweet little Emily, our daughter, she died of a sudden aneurysm just at a very young age. Charlotte's up in Alaska with her two children, and they don't get down to visit very often. Nicholas is in Denver, and he's doing wonderful things in the field of biology and ecology, and he has that darling little wife, Jan, and, and he named his daughter, they named his, the daughter Emily after his sister. 
darling, darling Jessica. She lives across the street from me and she visits every day when she can, when she's home. But she's got a life of her own and she doesn't need to worry about me. And then there's Teddy, my last remaining wonderful dog. I just don't know how to handle this. Fritz, how'd I do? I know I left out a lot of things, but I still kept rambling on and I'm so embarrassed talking so much about myself. But we really did have a beautiful life together, didn't we? And I think we made an impact on this town, especially you with your trails and hut systems. That was marvelous. Now, I have a plan. See you soon, Fritz. Love you. about her life, about early Aspen, or, or memories that you might want to share a bit. I have a microphone. I'll repeat questions so that we can get it both on film and so that everybody can hear. But does anyone have any questions for Fabi? Well, yes, sir. Why'd your ex give you a Jaguar after the divorce? Because <laughs> he wanted to get rid of me. <laughs> you think Hans really wanted to get rid of you? He was from Germany, and he was connected with a lot of automotive things and everything. And, um, you know, we sort of went our own way. Like I said, he was glad to get rid of me. <laughs> and yes, ma'am. Date of birth. What is your date of birth? Um, <laughs> I forgot. I told you I forgot my children's names. Uh, 1919. And you know, by the way, I always told people I was younger than I was. It wasn't until later on that I would admit how old I was. <laughs> Yes, Bobby, did you continue to make art when you were in Aspen? I did, and uh, I have I have some things that I could show you later on about that, but I loved artwork, and that was the saddest thing in the world that I couldn't continue with Parsons, because I loved art, and I sketched, and I did, I would give gifts to people, I'd make all sorts of funny things a lot, too, and give to people, but lots of gifts, yes. that you did, which enchanted Fritz, was you picked him up and carried him into one of the best parties anybody was ever having. You shouldn't tell so, them. <laughs> Let me just repeat that so that everybody can hear. Um, Murphy has a, a memory of, of, of you bringing, I was of strong. carrying Fritz, actually, into a party. Sure. Well, well, we did all, all sorts of funny things, you. didn't we? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> you can see how much I miss it, can't you? One, another question for Fabi? Yeah, so what, um, do you have any images of the lampshades that you made with Mina? I do you have, have any, have hold on, Jane, I'm sorry, Fabi, can oh, I, may sorry. I just repeat the question so that sorry. everybody can sorry. hear it? Um, do you, you have, have any of, I know, <laughs> that's why we're here for you. Do you have any of the lampshades? No. We don't images have, of them? Don't anything? have any images of them. I, or does anyone have You know what? Them? Actually, there's some images of them in the book, uh, Becoming Modern, Being Alone, of, of her making them. Uh -huh. And those were in uh, Peggy Guggen, the shop she had with Peggy Guggenheim. Were any of them sold here in Aspen, do we know? No. No, no that was in, in, so Paris. That was in Paris. That was in Paris and then in New York City. And so many things of Nina's have disappeared. There is a picture of me, 12 years old, in Mean Little Lloyd, the book on Mean Little Lloyd, the biography, um, done by Man Ray. Which I was, I was pretty cute. <laughs> <laughs> All right, I would like to introduce you to the actual woman who is here. So, once again, this is not actually Fabi Bennett. <laughs> this is Jane Clay. The 
Aspen Historical Society, um, but she uh, took the time to do the research involved with, and had met Bobby, yes, mm -hmm. and um, operated, so let's see, your store was Geraniums and Sunshine, yeah. that was here for how many years did you ever use? Three? 30. 30 years. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, like Carolee made things for the store. There you go. <laughs> and, and where is? Chris. There you are, she made the cakes for us. So, someday we'll be doing a Jane Click character. <laughs> <laughs> Not anytime soon. <laughs> um, but if anybody wants to ask Jane any questions about the research that she did or how she came about putting together this piece or anything beyond 1997, at this point. Jane, okay, you, did you choose this to do? Did you choose this character? I think I did. Yeah, yeah I did. Um, but I really, I love the research. I'm not an actress like all of these talented And would you not argue that that is untrue? But I, 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 I'm just fascinated by her. I mean, she really had an enormous impact on my life the more that I learned about her. She's an incredible woman. But somewhere in the research I read again, uh, they said, you know, they really should make a, a movie out of her life about Fabi's life, and but they said no one could play her. That's pretty intimidating. <laughs> Jane, she, she was wonderful. Roger, you have a question? Oh, Jane, would you care to expound upon her plan? Pardon me? Would you care to expound upon her plan? Hey, would you care to expound upon the plan. the plan you just referenced at the end of the piece? Uh, Fabi, so, this was done in May, her talk, and she did take her own life, yeah. and she had uh, the blessings of all her children and her friends and it's very fascinating because after Fritz died she really just missed him so much and she collected uh, pills from different doctors around town and she then she wrote letters to all these doctors to absolve them from any responsibility for her taking the pills and she told uh, Jesse don't come over until a little bit later in the morning that next day and she was there surrounded by pictures of her family and um, dressed up. She put a beautiful outfit on. She was always dressed beautifully. And they said she left her life the way she wanted to leave it. She wanted to be with Fritz. What year? 1997. 97? And, and he died. She was 78 years old. So, so <laughs> you can subtract that. We should all remember how old she was. But um, yeah, she she took her life on her own terms. You got a question, Michael? Jane, you did a, you did a great job. I, I I realized as you got into it how little I knew about Bobby. I, you know, I knew her superficially, but how little I appreciated what her background was. She was an extraordinary woman. And, she was even more extraordinary if you ever read all the things about her. She was yeah, just and I amazing. Wish I, I, and I, I think I John McBride is here, isn't he? Yeah. Somewhere. And yeah. he has he has stories on her that are amazing. I just wish I had known then what an extraordinary woman she was. We, we need to do this stuff about people who are still alive. <laughs> <laughs> so so the, the, the question is, do you know much about her life in Paris when she, yeah. What, what ages she was there? Do you know much about yes. that, what she was doing? She moved to Paris uh, when she was four years old. But then they would move, Mina would move around. Mina was, her life was really fascinating. But they would move all over the place, and most of the time she didn't live with her mother. They always brought maids in, and, and this uh, Julia was usually with her. Um, she was, evidently, she was very beautiful. And I think it was Gertrude Stein's brother that said of all of us, she was the most gorgeous. Her mother was beautiful. Um, she, um, she was very creative. She was very good at art. And she helped her mother. The, both Joella and Fabi were quite devoted to their mother. And then I think at one point, moving here, Joella and Fabi had, a, or Joella and Mina had a falling out. And then, uh, but they, they had to support her mother later on. So, but she, you know, moved. She moved in those circles. And she did bite people on their ankle. <laughs> and she did kiss in the, in the pastor's hand. <laughs> and on that note, um, let's give Jane a, a big round of applause. Um, 
I didn't introduce myself. I'm so sorry. My name is Nina Gabbianelli, and I am uh, 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 Vice President of the Aspen Historical Society in charge of the programming that we do and um, kind of headed up this character presentation project. And there are a few staff members that actually have a couple of different characters that they portray. And um, Michael is uh, going to be doing a second character today. But um, so we hope that he can focus back in. So we're going to bring everybody back to 1960. Okay? We're here in Aspen. We're actually going to be over at the Aspen Institute. And it is um, just about five days before the start of the um, International Design Conference. And we are gathering uh, speakers and, and presenters as well as then supporters and members. Um, some people know Mr. Bayer, some people do not. Um, but he has kind of had to take on this leadership role because unfortunately Walter Pepka has passed away about two months ago. And with his loss, with his friend uh, Herbert has taken on uh, some of that responsibility. And so this evening he is going to address us and share with us at the request of R.O. Anderson. He is here tonight to kind of pick up some of the slack and um, share with us a bit. So Mr. Byer, thank you so much for joining us this evening. Whatever you can do or dream you can, begin it. Boldness has power and genius and magic in it. Johann Wolfgang von Goethe. In just a few days, we begin the 1960 International Design Conference in Aspen, the corporation, the designer. My friend and collaborator, Robert O. Anderson, has asked me to address this informal gathering of associates, most of you from places far away from here, amidst the ruins of Aspen's mining age, when it was a village of staggering prosperity. Now Robert has insisted as one of the originators of this conference that uh, I supply some background information on myself before we begin. Now if I hear snores, <coughs> I do not promise not to be offended. <laughs> but I can tell you that if Walter Pepke was here, he would be the first to fall asleep. <laughs> but. As you know, my friend Walter passed away just eight short weeks ago. Allow me to read from a poem that I have written. I speak of Walter Pepke as my great friend. It is hard to realize that I don't see him anymore at his desk with a warm and friendly greeting, a teasing remark, a cynical beginning. Not anymore at the entrance of the Hotel Jerome with open shirt and baggy pants, greeting guests, which he loved to do. No more in conversations, turning from music and musicians to production of packages to civic developments in Aspen. We talked in airplanes, in sleeping cars of the California Zephyr, in picnics under trees at the bank of a mountain stream in Crystal, anywhere. He loved to talk, not about past or established things, but not about news, always about projects and new ideas and analyzing and probing into new ideas and exploring unknown fields. His mind untiringly on the go, active, brilliant and daring. There was nothing that he took for granted. When in preparation for the Goethe Bicentennial, it was thought, that the presence of Albert Schweitzer would be appropriate, but the he had refused an invitation. Walter did not accept this statement and brought Schweitzer to Aspen. <laughs> Everybody has a weakness or a price, he used to say. <laughs> His mind never worked in ordinary ways, entirely independent, sometimes seeming removed, often going in loops and somersaults. Once made up to materialize an idea, he pursued it relentlessly. His great sense of humor drew him to humorous people. A great teaser, he called me schnooky to my embarrassment, <laughs> even in business meetings. 
No, not that there were no differences of opinion when there were diverging or opposing beliefs. He would pat me on the shoulder and say, it wouldn't be fun if all people thought alike. He respected independence of thought, discarded the conformist, ready at any time to catch one off guard, to trap one unawares in the web of his schemes. There are no architects. There are only designers. I hope that eventually you will understand what I mean when I make that statement. I would like to think that my Bauhaus training in Germany, combined with my appreciation of the outdoors, made me uniquely suited to the Aspen landscape. Specialization can be detrimental. Exterior, interior, landscape, building, sculpture, painting should all reflect an overall strategy, appreciation, and synergy. Oh, that word, Bauhaus. So frightening, so Germanic. I arrived at the Bauhaus School in Weimar, Germany in 1921, within a few years of its opening. I was born in Hague, Austria, April 5th, 1900. So it is always easy for me to know exactly how old I am, take the year, subtract, knowing saying 100, and voila. So now in 1960, I am. Hog is near Salzburg, a mountain setting filled with art and music. My father was a tax collector, my mother an innkeeper's daughter. My first paintings reflected nature as I saw her, as I ventured out from the village, walking in nature through the countryside. I used the shapes and forms uh, that I saw on those climbing trips and walks to inform the peasant life around me. Baroque traditions, I feel, were still alive in the time, and the peasant was centered around going to church. The entire life was influenced by the Baroque, German Romantische expression. I went to high school in Linz. I was conscripted in the army late in World War I and moved to Germany. And while I always painted, I started using my skills in packaging and graphics. I learned that art could be used to illustrate ideas. There, I read Kandinsky's book. It excited me very much. And the first manifesto of the Bauhaus, the cover had a print from a wood carving symbolizing the socialist conditions. <coughs> much of my early work had a more romantic Baroque feel to it, as did this woodcut. But as the teachings of the Bauhaus began to take hold internally and within myself, our designs became more analytical, clear, and precise. Walter Gropius, Paul Klee, Kandinsky, Moholy Nagy, they would influence art teaching for the next 50 years. For myself, the realization that mathematics can be applied to all art forms, music, painting, the applied arts such as topography, the essence. This is the meeting of science and art as, as one, becoming one. We believe that art cannot be taught. You, know, you can teach the fundamentals of drawing or design or color, but you cannot teach inspiration or talent. They have to be there. The teacher cannot influence that, although that was the academic approach against which we turned. Weimar was the perfect place for study the seat of German poetry and statesmanship. Near the Bauhaus was Goethe's garden house. The garden was typical romantic design, very beautiful, and tied to our life at the Bauhaus. Very beautiful. Weekends there were always happenings. Unplanned, we played jokes on the bourgeoisie. <laughs> so there were repercussions, and we didn't necessarily fit in with the traditional study. We were regarded with suspicion, non-traditionals, radicals even. Some of our shenanigans were probably just youthful indiscretion, and, uh, but really we were a fraternity of idealists. Now Bauhaus was established to create the designer and artist for the machine age, modernity. We learned to use all technology. We used basic shapes, square, triangle, circle, each of which had its own primary color. And there was a communal spirit from knowing and talking with these 
unbelievable teachers that we had. I learned that you, you work and you design and learn by doing. No separation. Conceptual, the work, all part of the same thing. In 1922, I executed a big wall mural from Kandinsky. We also worked in photography, which had never been part of art school training. Everything we touched, we saw or felt, could be part of design. It was a logical decision to use all mediums. Photography <coughs> lent itself to graphics and advertising. <coughs> Topography was a role in everything. Inflation was rising so quickly that the country needed new money. I was given one weekend to design new currency. It wasn't just a matter of adding more zeros, although there were a lot of zeros. We bypassed the typical problems associated with hand-engraved printing, an accomplished task. In 1923, I took a year's leave, hiking through Italy. The contact with nature, as it had in my youth, left a lasting imprint on me. I did quite a bit of painting. You could see the influence on the landscape. By the time I got back to the Bauhaus in 1924, the Nazis were making life difficult and the school was moved to Dessau. Our approach always becoming more analytical, refining, cleaning, distilling down to the essence of design. 1928. I personally decided to leave the Bauhaus, although I had been made a master, a teacher. I felt I was too young, lacking in experience to take on this responsibility, so I moved to Berlin, continuing to work on typographical design, got involved in exhibition design, which was becoming known as a new discipline. This incorporated all art, all design forms. We saw possibilities, including walls and ceiling, as part of exhibit design. I called it extension of vision. I utilized close-up views as well as panoramic view. What was possible? How could the space contribute to the artist's vision and complement the work? As to politics, I do not think that we thought that Hitler would last long. He was simply a crazy man. My, my associates would go watch his speeches to be amused. But the Nazis hated the Bauhaus and cut off our funds for being too liberal, too decadent, 1933, the Bauhaus closed its doors and an exit of Germany's finest talent began. I left in 1938 to come to the United States to continue exhibition design and to reunite with my teachers and colleagues. Most of us ended up in New York City or in Chicago. Moholy Nagy had intended to start a new Bauhaus in Chicago. I was to teach. Somewhere along the way, the plans fell through. Coming to the United States, I was the victim of a false report from an immigration officer in Germany. Going through customs in New York, the immigration officer kept me to the last. I had a guitar. He said, are you a musician? I said, no, an artist. He said, I have a report that you are colorblind. <laughs> but what color is my uniform? I told him the exact color of blue that his suit was. He seemed confused. <laughs> I asked, uh, he asked me what color the paper was, I said white of course, and he showed me a seal of some sort and said what color is that, I told him the exact shade of red that it was. He sighed, well, I guess you're not totally colorblind, we'll let you in. <laughs> 1938, I designed the first Bauhaus complete exhibit in the United States, covering our work from 1919 to 1928. When I first came to New York, it was overpowering to me. I was a, a country boy. I'd come from the forest, uh, 20 miles from Salzburg. I loved the exchange of ideas, but away from nature was a challenge for me, so I spent my weekends getting away, uh, going up to Long Island or uh, various havens outside of the city. I've always thought of myself primarily as a painter, but the Bauhaus instilled in me a sense of duty I felt that I should devote myself to dealing with the design problems of the time within which I lived. I've never been a city boy. Whenever I had problems or needed solutions, I would go for a walk. This communion with nature is very important. During this time in New York City, I met my wife, Joella. 
daughter of the famed Mila Loy, mother of both Joella and half-sister Fabienne. Later, we would introduce Fabi to my friend and associate, Fritz Benedict, and Fabi persuaded Fritz to quit ranching and uh, pursue architecture, which he did. After being awarded a license under a grandfather clause, I did not have an architectural license in the United States. Fritz was given one based on experience, not training, and we used that to work together. In 1943, I practiced my theories on extension of vision in an exhibit at the Museum of Modern Art, Road to Victory, America's Struggle Against Fascism. In 1944, I designed the exhibition Airways to Peace at the Museum of Modern Art, an exhibition to make people aware of the war, the global conflict, and to see that our world was becoming a smaller place, mostly because of the aeroplane. Maps are distortions. When we look at a flat map, the globe has been extended like an orange peel to fit. There's much distortion. So I utilized what we call the inside-out globe. And you stepped inside and looked up, and the maps were on the inside. That was somewhat revolutionary. Now, Walter Pepke and I became acquainted when he hired me to do some advertising and graphic design for his Container Corporation of America. I did a series on the great ideas of the Western man. These paintings presented a statement about the visual interpretation of the fundamental nature of rights of man. In 46, Walter Pepka invited me to visit this virtually abandoned village in the Colorado mountains. He had an idea that skiing could re revitalize Aspen's economy. Skiing was natural to me from my early days in Austria. The economy of skiing would provide a basis to build a future community upon. Walter suggested that I could design and build that new community. Joella and I felt that this project offered us a unique opportunity to create something very new, very special, to get back to nature for me and utilize my training, my concepts, far too tempting to pass up. But the rumor got around that I was restoring Austin to its Victorian splendor. Completely incorrect. I would never think to reconstruct an architectural style from the past. It was requirements of a different time. Gropius and I both agreed on this. It is important to preserve the worthy examples of the past. But when building to build modern, never to be derivative. In fact, we hated some of the Bavarian Swiss styles that were being built around town. Entirely out of place. Some of the original should be best preserved. When I first came to the Wheeler Opera House, it was burned on the interior. I was tasked with remodeling the interior, and I did it all from freehand using the curve of the balcony and the arc of the proscenium. Also at that time, I took on the task of designing a new world geographic atlas. During a visit to Vermont, I suddenly saw the mountains, not as textured and detailed shapes, but as expressions of internal forces, as undulating forms whose motion is called by geology and time. I was inspired, and it suggested me the means by which to do this atlas. <laughs> I'm not a geologist. I'm not a scientist, but all knowledge overlaps. I'm an artist who has the ability to translate facts and figures into the visual. My intellectual environment is now the Austin Institute for Humanistic Studies, which sprang from the Goethe Bicentennial, which I helped organize. After the convocation, which was in the summer of 1949, Thornton Wilder, who spent the entire summer there with us, wrote, Here on all sides we are reminded of Goethe. Here are the mountain peaks of Prometheus and roadside flowers, the torrent, the stream. Here, visible to us as they could not be above a lighted city, are the great stretches of sky, the laps of constellations. Here, with particular advantage, we strive to follow Goethe, trying to grasp his doctrine of the unity of all living things, where life and death and art and nature all crystallize in the mountain and the aspen tree and the home beside the road and Mozart's C major symphony all proceed from the shaping force at the heart of the universe. 
it was decided by all involved that the ideals set forth in the Goethe Bicentennial should be expounded in the sort of open university designed to link the ideas from different parts of the world and the arts. Pepco was our first chairman. We strive to be an international forum discussing ideas and information and sharing, collaborating, and then sending it out in the world to grow and change. We are not necessarily trying to make a big noise, just ripples. Some of these small ripples may become international in scope. This is part of mind, body, and spirit. The people we bring here get involved in nature, in appreciating and exercising, and then discuss these human topics, and as we said, take them back to wherever they've come from. Hopefully these get planted and grow in new soil. I'm a trustee of the Institute was instrumental in the planning and design of the whole physical setting within which the institute functions. Small scale open areas fitted to human size activities. I'm fortunate to use all of my talents, painting, sculpture, exterior design, landscape. It harkens back to those glorious days at the Bauhaus. We involved other associates in time, but it wasn't always fruitful. Walter once said of, said of Moholy Nagi, well, Moholy is not a person whom I can introduce to businessmen who are to support us. He's too unusual of an animal, you know. <laughs> My friend Walter was hard on the surface, admitting of no weakness, not showing any softness. He had a warm heart and radiated affection. Praise left his lips only indirectly, and admiration was not shown in words, but in acts of confidence. Like a child clings to his toys, he held on to objects he was attached to. In his old office, he sat eloquent, elegant, and confident behind an old double roll-top desk, which had belonged to his father. It was a desk that was shapeless in my mind in terms of design, but to him, a cherished piece with memories. Only with extended maneuvers, when I designed his new office, could I pry him loose from it. And this attachment tradition rather uh, endeared him to me. <clears throat> in 1954, we were designing and building the Institute. Walter and his musicians had a huge falling out. Walter, in a fit of misguided thrift, wanted to eliminate the music which had been so integral from the beginning, but was costing him money. Walter had been raising money for the Institute and the music as a package, but funding music became the main expense. In one of the biggest disagreements he and I ever had, I told Walter that he had lost sight of his vision and was preaching humanism without practicing it. Walter on the spot admitted that I was right. Walter pulled the funding but let the musicians the use of the tent and the dormitories. Walter told the papers that he was withdrawing due to reasons of health, nervous energy, available time. He'd always had a bit of trouble fundraising locally. He was perhaps a bit heavy-handed. His idea that businesses should donate 5% of their gross to the Institute and the music went over about as well as his offer to <laughs> donate to the locals free paint as long as Schnucky got to pick the color. <laughs> Perhaps it was the problem. Maybe the locals didn't like the relatively unsubtle pink that I painted Walter and Pussy's house in the West End. I believe some of the locals referred to it as Pussy Pepka's Pink Palace. <laughs> as an independent festival, though, the musicians gained traction and momentum and the businesses in town realized that they actually made money from the music. When the newly liberated musicians pled their cause and formed a conga line around the time, the businesses were willing to give to the cause as long as they were guaranteed that they did not have to attend the concerts. <laughs> Much to everyone's amazement, the funds to sustain that summer's festival were raised in just three weeks, perhaps contrite, as well as astounded, Walter tried to bring music back into the fold of the Institute, but the musicians, flushed with their newly found freedom, were not tempted. Some feel that the 
music festival and the institute have become like an old married couple squabbling and retreating to separate bedrooms. Elizabeth was embittered enough that for quite a while she was not speaking to anyone connected with the festival. Mm -hmm. Oh, I must say, I'm quite impressed with one student, uh, Forrest Miller, who started Uncle Forrest Annual Christmas Concert. He advertises the price as just 25 cents for those from nine months to 90 years old. All others admit free as long as accompanied by both parents. <laughs> I think that Walter was quite proud of the music festival in school. How much his heart was in Aspen, I perceived, when we discussed in a meeting a summer folder for Aspen, a small expenditure, on the same day that at the Container Corporation there was in a meeting a record time a very large budget approved for the World Geographic Atlas. Next day he asked, didn't it go well yesterday? And I expressed appreciation for this unanimous, generous and important decision. He brushed his aside and said, oh no, no, not the Atlas. I meant the Aspen folder. A businessman with too much imagination to be satisfied to solve problems or what he called the profanity of boxes. <laughs> Over the course of years in Aspen, uh, I became friends with Gary Cooper, the film actor. He appreciated many of the same things about Aspen that I did. I think that at one point he was amused when a news article in the Denver paper described me as the most world famous person in Aspen. I assured him that he was far more famous than me. Uh, I told him once that I hoped to sketch and draw wild birds, but they were hard to get to stay close and stand still. <laughs> Within a matter of days, I came home to find a box on the patio of our home, and inside the box were two small owls. I put the owls into a cage, and they would sit out of the cage in the studio and watch me with their eyes, turning their heads all the way around to see where I would go. I would leave the cage open, they would fly around at night. They always returned to the cage. Walter made fun of my attachment to those birds, but I wonder if maybe he saw me as his owl. <laughs> always watching, always following him. He would allow me to fly free, and then I always came back. <clears throat> Walter was relentlessly driven by his imagination. The demands upon him and the stresses and strains of the projects reflected on his composure made him at times unreasonable and difficult. Only those who faced him with the lack of understanding the petty oppositions know the magnitude of his efforts, the tensions he suffered from lack of sympathy. Not well enough known and still not believed here, the sacrifices he personally made to cover unselfishly financial losses, still more privation is he was not a rich man. You know, witty and cynical, he was a formidable opponent, respected, feared, and loved. His plans to improve on life were not so much material as idealistic, himself being a frugal man who often said, what would I need more money for? I can only sleep in one bed, can only eat three meals in a day. He was not an easy spender unless he was sure of the good of it. Once at his ranch in Larkspur, he talked on a long evening about creating many aspens to develop the natural springs of Colorado a day's drive from each other into spas with bathhouses and all. I would do the designs. He had it all figured out, down to the rentals of towels. <laughs> there is a fascination with art as a form of self-expression. My work is not a form of self-expression. Self-expression is not important. This is a misunderstanding. If I'm producing something, I'm not expressing myself. I'm expressing the thing that I am producing. I believe there's a higher power that is producing these things through me. I am a medium for expression. All nature, all we are part of is made by God. 
We can only operate by having lives, by being alive. And life cannot be made, it is given. I believe that sometimes in this modern world, we have lost that connection to a higher power. A man can have a relationship with God, with nature, and still use technology. If a relationship with nature was lost through progress, then we must capture and develop a balanced attitude between man and the natural, man-made and the natural-made. In respecting nature, we can be magical and poetic. We must not try to imitate nature, but create a world inside of itself, side by side with nature. To me, the artist is simply a mirror which allows one to see something you would not see without the artist. It's all a search, a search for something missing, something unknown. Walter was never afraid of the unknown. Walter was courageous. He would face anything in life. He could have walked into a room full of devils and not batted an eye. The most courageous was when he was facing the end. It's hard to realize that he is no more walking among us because of everything here reflects from him or came through him or reverted to him who made so many decisions, took on so many cares. Walter's ashes are now in an aspen grove looking over the valley where his imagination roamed, where his dreams took form, where he was often misunderstood. I pay tribute to his strong convictions, to his independence, I think of him being the community of men aspiring to higher planes, to deeper understanding, improving human relations and useful goods towards a more complete life. I think of his concern with education, with the morals and ethics of man. I acknowledge what he has done for so many. I thank him for what he has meant to me his plans, far from completed, are here for his friends, for us to continue, for you, for us, for we to continue. And so we, we must strive to move forward, always towards Walter's ideal, the complete man, body, mind, spirit. Mr. Byer questions. <laughs> yes, Mr. Kinsley. So when when you and, and Walter conceived the Goethe Bicentennial, were so close on following the war, were, were you not afraid of controversy or even the danger of celebrating the Germanic after we had been fighting those people? And let me repeat the question, please. So in 1949, when you and Walter to actually put on the Goethe Bicentennial here in Aspen, were you not concerned about the attitudes of this country at that time towards um, Germany? It's a, a very wonderful question, and obviously myself being uh, Austrian and uh, Herbert, uh, I mean Walter being of Germanic descent, although he was born in America, the concern was that many of the things that began World War II were involved in nationalism, German nationalism, American nationalism, British nationalism, the, the belief in each country that they were superior to everybody else. After coming together globally, the Allies defeated the Axis and this great threat to freedom throughout the world. Then we saw in the aftermath of the war the complete return to those nationalist views. Now first off, Goethe himself was, for his time, a bit of a globalist, believed in humanity as a whole and not nations, and that humanity crossed borders. So the attempt was to bring that which was good of Germany back into the mainstream, but to reinforce, as we saw the return of nationalism after the war, the idea that we belong together and that the hate and the things that caused war had no place in the modern society. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Thank you, Mr. Byron. 
Any other questions for Herbert? Yes. Did you and Herbert actually uh, ski? Uh, Walter did not ski. I did ski, and Joella skied. And uh, one of the great joys for me was moving to this town and getting the chance to take advantage of what I enjoyed so much in my youth. That was very much a part of the attraction of coming here. Any other questions for Mr. Byer? Yes, in the back. What would Mr. Byer's thoughts be on how Aspen has evolved since his time? <laughs> so, if you could expound into the future of where Aspen may be headed, Mr. Byer, well, what would you think could we could become? Well, the, I, I plan to stay in Aspen as long as possible. I, I will continue to work for the Institute for Robert O. Anderson, who will assume much of the duties of the leadership that, that Walter had at the time. I think we can already see that perhaps the community is growing a bit faster than we expected, <laughs> and this could be a danger. Uh, what I do appreciate are all the new ideas. I love seeing different architectural styles side by side, <coughs> downtown, out throughout the neighborhoods. I would simply hope that the community as a whole would take the time and have the foresight to make things change as beneficially as possible. Thank you. <laughs> Any other questions? We've got a question for Mr. Byer. In the context of painting buildings, how did you decide to paint the chrome white with eyebrows? What was your inspiration in painting the brick Hotel Jerome white? with those beautiful blue eyebrows? It, much of it was a question of economy. At the time, the brick was in uh, pretty poor repair. So we had to find a way to preserve it. We had to beautify the town. This was all uh, in the knowledge that many people from all over the world would be descending on the community in 1949. So, uh, the white paint seemed to be the quickest way. I, it, in a way, sort of matched the landscape of the community in the winter, the color of snow. Uh, it was a few years later that we added the blue. Uh, the color, I, I can say, with, with some humility, became known as bio blue. <laughs> and unfortunately, my intention was that that blue be a significantly darker shade than what occurred as it faded over the years. So many people's impression of what bio blue is is quite different than, than what mine is. And there's a question in the back. Do you ever return to Europe after coming to the United States? Oh, Have you returned to Europe? Yes, yes, for exhibitions and, and, and convocations. I would spend time in, uh, uh, you know, meeting with designers. Uh, but my focus for the very much of the time was, was right here in Colorado. And there's another question in the back. Did you work with Errol Sarabin on the music venue of 1949? Were you involved uh, in the association with Errol Sarabin? Str strictly as a consultant, the design was pretty much Sarabin's. Um, and he adapted a, cir uh, a circus tent design with a stage and audience seating and acoustic enhancements inside. Um, I assume eventually that tent will be replaced, and who knows, that may have something to do with that. <laughs> yes. Were you and Franz Berko friends? Oh, were you and friends with? Let me repeat the question. Sure. I'm sorry. Um, thank you. Were, were you and um, Franz Berko or Franz Berko friends? One of Walter's specialties was in pulling people from different places and different talents all together in one place, and his eye for talent and personality was astonishing. And Verico was a very talented artist. Uh, in my youth, uh, I'd experimented with photography as an art form in the back of the Bauhaus. So yes, I enjoyed him very much and his work very much. All right. So ladies and gentlemen, I would like, do we have another question? I'm sorry. Very good. Just a question about what prompted you to leave Germany exactly? Was it, was it oh, you so, felt personally threatened or, or something else? What was it that prompted you to leave Germany? If there was a silver lining in the uh, dissolving of the Bauhaus, it was that most of us lost the attachment to Germany <coughs> and the political climate. And had it happened later, we might not have gotten out. 
so the fact that we could actually leave Germany before the, the Nazis prevented us. I always felt that uh, the fact that, that Hitler himself was a, a failed artist had something to do with him shutting down the street. <laughs> but uh, we, we were quite lucky, and some of us went to the Soviet Union, some of us came to America, but in terms of the future of the, 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 the sustainability of the Bauhaus principles, we're quite fortunate that the school was shut down. Was shut down. So, ladies and gentlemen, I would like to introduce you to who this actually is. <laughs> this is Mike Monroney. Most yeah. of you are familiar. Yeah. Mike works at the Aspen Historical Society, and he created this character actually during our um, 50th anniversary for one of our first Chautauqua performances that we did. Um, and hasn't had a chance to do this for a while, so gosh darn thank you to the Bauhaus Centennial. We'll probably be seeing more of Herbert throughout the year, I would yeah. think. Yes. But if anyone would like to ask Mike any questions about his research, about his study, about um, his choices, please feel free. Or anything that happened to Herbert after right. you know, or what, Herb, what do you think Herbert would think of 2019 Aspen? <laughs> Um, I think he would be excited by the exploration of design and architecture and art and dismayed by the prevalence of money and development and losing maybe some of the artistic integrity. But I think he, I mean, I mean what he would also be able to look at other places where it's far worse than it is here, and realize that at least some of the intention, a lot of the intention, still exists mm -hmm. today. Lisa, what was your favorite thing you learned? What's your research? favorite thing that you learned in your research? And I'm assuming that you sort of re-looked at it again. I did. Yeah. Um, it's just how incredibly busy and involved and interested and diverse his interests were. Just the geographical atlas that he did might have been one person's life's work. And it was just another project that he accomplished along the way. Um, it's interesting, if he had gone out into the world and worked a lot of different places like so many of the other Bauhaus artists and designers did, he'd be far more well-known than he is today. But because he stayed in Aspen, you know, he worked for Walter for essentially 15 years. Walter passed away far too early at the age of 63. Um, and then he stayed and continued to work for um, Arco, and they built one of the largest private art collections in the world um, at, at Arco. And he did some other design work at, uh, for Anaconda Oil, which we now have that wonderful sculpture back over behind the music tent that's been pulled out of mothballs. <laughs> so I'm just, I, the, the, um, the breadth of his curiosity to me is astonishing. And for those of you who don't know, here's our shameless plug number two. Uh -huh. um, the Aspen Historical Society has um, an exhibit on display now through probably the spring of 2020, but it is called Bayer and Bauhaus, How Design Shaped Aspen. And we have in our collection many pieces that Herbert Bayer gave to us in 1974. Um, and we have things that have never been displayed before, a uh, series of you know, progressions uh, working towards posters that were eventually used for the FIS races, um, as well as the Geo Atlas that, that Mike was referring to. Um, uh, designs for the sun deck, um, all sorts of amazing pieces that are in this collection um, and on exhibit uh, 11 to 5, Tuesday through Saturday at the Wheeler Stoller Museum at 620 West Bleeker. Um, that's in addition to then, of course, the exhibit that's on permanent or the what is on display rotating different pieces at the Aspen Institute as well. That Lisa is the curator of the buyer exhibit there or the buyer collection. Is that correct? Yes. I want to make sure I say that right. Um, so there's, you know, obviously more ways to find out more about Herbert Bayer, um, especially as we explore the Bauhaus um, throughout the rest of this year, especially through the summer months with all sorts of uh, uh, 
events that will be scheduled and taking place all over through different organizations throughout the valley this year. Yes, Mr. Jones. Thank you, Mike, for a wonderful lesson on the character here. Thank you, David. Yes. <laughs> yes. Uh, Mike, thank you, and as well as Jean, the hours you spent in, prepar in preparation, and if you have any idea approximately how long it took you to do the script, how many hours do you think it took you to put this Oh, gosh. You know, that, so this was done back prior to the summer of 2013. And we did it first at uh, Holden World Mining Ranch Museum and then later on the museum grounds in, in town. Um, I don't really know the answer to that question. Um, it's not like we sit down and work on one for, uh, yeah. you know, that's the only thing we're doing. So it, it tends to be something that gets accumulated. But I would say it takes at least 40 to 80 hours of research, writing, learning, to really, you know, he just presented to you a bit of the information that he's learned. He has the essence and the ideology of Herbert and had to learn what was going on in the world and what was going on in Aspen at the same time. So it's not just memorizing a script. It's learning a lot about that person and what's going on in, in, in context to that person. Um, so I would say each of the characters that I've done and, and, and yeah. that you've done takes at least 40 hours of research. It's, and it's, you know, I was lucky to be able to talk to some people who knew him. Oh, sure. Um, and there are some, there's some old videos of him. And those of you who know him know that he could be a pretty slow and deliberate speaker. I have to juice him up a little bit. <laughs> um, We'd be here all night. Yeah, I know. Um, and uh, I don't know. I just I I I, I had a suit. I, mean, I got to choose who I was going to do. I mean, obviously one could possibly do Walter Peck himself, but I just felt physically and age wise. Um, that he was, a, that Byro was an appropriate choice, and I really resonate with the fact that he grew up, you know, in a place where he could enjoy nature, and chose to live in a place where he could continue to, to experience that. Did you grow up in an area? I grew up in Arvada, Colorado, and my family did a lot of camping and hiking and fishing with my father, which I very much appreciate. And when it came down to finding a career path. I, in 1986, I spent a month in New York City with no pressure, just to see if I enjoyed it. And what I noticed is that my friends who were successful in the performing arts, this was your life. It was about getting a job, and that was pretty much it. And I decided that that's not how I wanted to live my life. So I've been really lucky to be in Colorado most of my whole life. So you never have to say, I wish I had it. I don't really think so. Yeah, no. that's all I uh -huh. <laughs> Did you have a question? Uh, just that I can't imagine, you know, the impact anyone <coughs> today has had on the pet these days. Mm -hmm. Benedicts, Benedict Bears. Um, in, one, in this day and age, besides Jane Cliff, <laughs> um, that has had that kind there's of one impact. right over there, Michael Kinsley. Uh, maybe yeah. an Aspen. Right? Well, I mean, there's, a, there's, one. there's yeah. a whole bunch of Aspen royalty here tonight. Right. There's a John yeah. McBride and a Dave Durns and a Michael Kinsley. There's yeah. people out here that I haven't even so we'll had a chance to see here. So. Through the Aspen Society. Yeah. Probably. Because, I mean, it, like you said, you know, it's, it's the money that talks these days. But, you know, it's a shame because Well, the money so, spoke back then, so too. Much don't don't, don't, don't oh, be yeah. confused. Yeah. Yeah, Walter Pepke had a lot of money, yeah. right. and that's how he got things done. So you know you have to you have to. I understand the romantic vision of it, but they had the money, and that's why they were going to buy the paint, right? But they didn't let you pick the paint. They were going to do it in your color, but they were going to supply it. So they had the money. So you know you get uh, be careful when you you romanticize it. I mean they had great vision. And I think there's incredible people in this town, you included, myself included, you included, you included, you included, you included. all of us here. have great vision. That's why we're here. That's what Aspen, that's what makes Aspen special. No, it's good that some of are In my opinion, yeah. is that we're all from different backgrounds, all different ideas, and that's what we, we, we mix it together, and, and that's what makes this soup so special. I don't know, that's my, 
two cents. Um, I want to honor everybody's time. It's a little after seven. I thank you all for being here this evening. Next week, for those of you who are interested, we are going to have the strong and scandalous women represented. I might be one of them. Some of the people um, in this room might be one. Right? We have a, a madam from Aspen's past, as well as um, Captain Jack, if anyone's familiar with her. She actually did live here briefly, I have just learned, uh, in 1885, but uh, is more commonly associated with the Crystal River Valley. And so, um, come on and meet, uh, meet them next week, and we look forward to seeing you in the future. Thank you so much, and good night.